We've all been transported to worlds beyond our wildest imagination with books. But books are also a great vehicle to get together and exchange ideas. Welcome to Books du Jour. Come and join our authors at the table. So my first guest of this brand new season is uh, Pamela Fiore. And uh, in the spirit of Monte Carlo, and then you have a pretty massive resume. You were at Italian country for a long time. Maybe the next step will be to work for the White House, maybe? No? Never. Never? They wouldn't hire me. David Schaefer, um, Whiskey, Tango, and Foxtrot, the first novel, correct? Yes. My congratulations. And uh, Rebel Souls, Walt Whitman and America's First Bohemian by Justin Martin. So, Pamela, let me start with you. Uh, your book, obviously, it's not a travel guide, you know, but it has some element of it. Could it be like a, a biography of the city? Yeah. I try to sort of capture what the spirit of the place is, why it's lasted as long as it has, and, uh, and it's fun. What's so important for you to, to write about those places? Uh, or what do you think you want to share with us? Well, I family? always find out that there is a lot more history there than people suspect. Uh, in the case of uh, Monaco, I always thought, well, here you've got a, a principality that is uh, run by a young, handsome prince, a uh, long, long line of, uh, of royals. And I thought, well, that was that, until I realized that at one time it was dirt poor. It was just a little rock, and they were, people were starving on it. And uh, what turned it around was the idea to build a gambling casino. And that changed everything. So the Grimaldis have been there for a long time? More than 700 yes, years. Yes, and I was, I was actually struck by how long they've been in power. Probably the longest dynasty in Europe. Yeah. Longest dynasty in Europe. Uh, and it's a tiny little place. It's the size of Central Park. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's one of the richest places on earth. Lots of money, always has been, except as, as soon as the casino was built, life turned around for it. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's now, there are a lot of Russians coming in, mm -hmm. buying up a lot of uh, land, a lot of real estate. So uh, it's thriving. So your book, Whiskey, Tango, and Foxtrot, the, the titles, it's not about dancing. Was it a kind of dancing, but? It is not about dancing. It is a, uh, you, one hopes that you also read the, um, the WTF, which is a boldlerism or bowdlerism, I forget how to say the word, um, or euphemism uh, for what the f Yeah. Um, we and will, I will guess that. And <laughs> it, is, uh, <laughs> it is meant both in the profane and in the sort of philosophical meaning of that. Um, the, the baffledness of being a human and uh, the strangeness of the story that unfolds. Sure. So your book tackles the big topics, uh, privacy and uh, big data age and also uh, privatization of data. Uh, um, is it because you got inspired by Snowden and all his uh, Julian Assange stories or you, you came up with a well, book I, before? Well, I began writing it but uh, in 2000. Eight. I mean, this stuff was ascendant, but uh, mm -hmm. I actually had a hard time keeping up with the curve of you know the surveillance state. Uh, things that I wrote and I thought were absurd um, came true. Yeah, I was reading about uh, Rupert Murdoch because all the mess they had with the listening phone calls yeah. in England, and he he was very sarcastic or sort of cynical upon the the deliberation that uh, the man woman got uh, got set free or clear oh, yeah. and saying that uh, and co compared to what she did compared to what Google is doing right now it's just like it's laughable Do you, would you agree with that or they're not really comparable it's true that Google or Facebook or Twitter or any of these guys has um, a dossier on all of us that the Stasi would uh, kill for you know um, but we've all agreed to that essentially I take no precautions. Uh, well, I, I do now put blue tape over the webcam, but that's about it. Okay. People maybe want to know about the, the, the zest of the story and the two, two friends. Um, it is a thriller and should pull you in that way. Um, it has three characters uh, in their 30s. There's a, a Persian-American NGO worker in Myanmar and two sort of lost souls male uh, men in yeah, back and here, and they get swept up in a in a 
um, an absurd conspiracy. Yeah, but it's about the privatization of information. The, the evil cabal that they oppose is certainly stealing all of it, which they'll either sell back to us or use against us. We have a mythology of those first Bohemian here, yes? That is right. Yeah. But uh, it's always interesting when your books actually reveal a slice of history that is not really talked about, yeah? What was the, um, the trigger that for you that you say, I have to write that book? Well, the trigger was, I have to give credit where credit's due, I actually had a university professor um, who I was chatting with, he said, you should look in the FAFs, and people are constantly giving me FAF Saloon, but I thought I'll do my due diligence and okay. look into this idea of FAF Saloon. I started doing some research and I was instantly hooked by what an interesting, fascinating, untold story it was. And soon I was writing a book proposal. Well, and, yeah. I know the Fab Saloon because I read the book, but people I'm sure don't know. So you, you have to give us uh, some uh, information. Fab yeah. Saloon is, is the, the meeting place of America's very first Bohemia during the 1850s in New York City. It was at the intersection of Broadway and Bleecker Street. It's a subterranean saloon, is in below ground level, and in a little vaulted room. Um, um, Walt Whitman, a man named Artemis Ward, who was America's first stand-up comic, um, a woman named Ada Isaacs Macon, who became notorious for something called the Naked Lady Act, a man named Fitzhugh Ludlow, who wrote one of the best-selling books of 1857, The Hashish Eater. They all sat along this long table mm -hmm. almost every single night um, in the late 1850s, drinking, fighting, arguing, and inspiring and goading each other on their artwork. But you may also the point that it was also the first gay bar. Half of it was a separate room with a long table where this group of artists met, but the other half was just, you might call it a, a saloon that drew people who didn't fit into 1850s society of all stripes, including gay men. Walt Whitman, he spent, as you might imagine, this, this bar was tailor-made for Walt Whitman. He spent half the time at the long table with his fellow artists. He spent the other half of the time out in the main room of the saloon meeting other gay men. So it, it, it suited him to a T. Um, do you think because of the, uh, what has become the icon in poetry and the leaves of grass was written mostly in that place, do you think the Faf Saloon became famous because of that or otherwise it would have just disappeared like other places? Yeah, well, I guess I'd say it disappeared anyway. In fact, I came across a, a modern biography of Whitman that described his four essential years at Faf's as an obscure period in his life. So I think Faf's in Whitman's career has been sort of, um, had been kind of lost in history. So Fab was a place, but the, the driver was Henry Clapp behind that, that or? That's correct. I mean, you, you credit him as importing Bohemia into America. That's exactly right. Yeah. Faf was a, a temperance lecturer who went to Paris in the 1840s at the very height of La Vida Bohème. Um, he, a temperance lecturer, he quickly fell off the wagon and into Bohemia, started drinking, got completely absorbed in Parisian-style Bohemia. He then came back to America and he set up this, he was the one who sat at the head of that long table with Whitman and Artemis Ward and the others um, who I mentioned earlier. And so um, Clapp was sort of the, the founder of the feast, the one who sat at the head of the table and all of those people um, kind of self-consciously modeled themselves after this French model of Bohemia that, that he brought over. Did you knew about it? Uh, I did not know about yeah. Faf's. I uh, also pictured uh, Walt Whitman in some sort of ethereal plane. Yeah, like Thoreau, you um, go in the cabin in the woods yeah, yeah, and you write I, the book, I right? them, It has to do with being taught these people, right? I mean, a certain mythos applies and apparently it's not, you know, the true one. It's, a, it's opaque to me. Why is Bohemia, Bohemian, why does it mean what it does to us? It means what it does to us because um, in France, the lifestyle was actually codified and you had, in fact, La Vie de Bohème, which was a sensation in Paris in the 1840s, describe all the enduring qualities of, of what a Bohemian was, you know, someone who lived for art, someone who was sexually open, someone who was experimental with substances, and also it has the enduring notion that Bohemians die young, often from chilly Garrett conditions. So yeah. it's such a useful term because if someone, if someone who's, uh, you know, doesn't have much money and is kind of wild, crashes on your couch for the weekend, you'll probably call them a bohemian. <laughs> Were there such a things in, Mona in Monaco in um, 1840? There was a lot of that in, in uh, Monaco at that time. So yeah, they had, they had that element. And in fact, at one point, they, they, it drew a lot of criticism because people were looking at it as this little corner of sin 
on the French Riviera. Is it sin or is it corruption or what? Well, it was certainly, cor it was certainly corrupt. There's a lot of sort of under the table dealings and a lot of black market uh, stuff going on. I mean, but yeah, sin in the sense of you know, what, what a uh, traditional puritanical minister at that time might view and looking at Monaco and seeing, you know, these people who were dressed extravagantly and throwing scads of money on the table and, you know, wasting their lives away and, 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 and maybe losing their fortunes. I mean, a lot of uh, new author, and there seems to be a, a trend that uh, there's a sort of cynicism uh, about society now where we live. And your book has a bit of that element, not that you are cynical, but it's the stories are. Do you feel like, uh, does that resonate with you when I say that, or? Well, yes, but the book is optimistic in, 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 in the end. It really is. It, the characters finally don't represent that cynicism. They live in a world in which you have to wear that. These guys, in the end, uh, come good and overcome that. They, they seem a bit lost yeah. in their life, yeah. very much lost. Yeah. Yeah. And when we write uh, an optim optimistic message at the end of the book, is it because the publisher wants it? Or is it because you feel you have to do it? Or you have to, the message has to be put out there for other people to learn? It could never have ended any other way. I mean, um, they, these three characters are lost mm. uh, professionally and, and emotionally, uh, but they are offered a chance by the, the secret online underground that's opposing the mm -hmm. bad cabal, uh, a chance to live and to help make a world that is more democratic and, and uh, less cynical, and they take it. You know, Abraham Lincoln had a uh, wonderful quote about optimism. He said, I'm an optimist because I don't see the point of being anything else. It's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's true. Okay. So when did uh, Monaco become from uh, the, the d dusty rock to this uh, glamorous um, in, shaping? In the uh, late Brand, 18th yeah. century when a lot of things were going on in Europe and in America. It does seem that way. Yeah, yeah, it really it does seem that way. It was a very fertile time. Yeah. The prince at the time, Prince Charles, was persuaded to meet with this man by the name of Francois Blanc, who had gambling casinos in Germany. And he and his wife met with the prince, and they struck a very fruitful deal to build a concession for a number of years. and built what uh, is now the existing casino. So the casino was the first thing that sort of drew in a certain kind of money. And then Marie Blanc, the wife, uh, said that I'm going to take care of all the cultural aspects, and built the opera house, and installed some other aspects of, of, of the arts. And suddenly they were not just attracting gamblers, they were attracting people who are interested in music and in art and, and uh, a lot of other things. So it changed the complexion of the people who were going there. So if I want to move there now, can I do it? You'd have a hard time finding real estate. Uh, they, they, there's no, and there's no space. You, so Everything you can't is build. vertical. Okay, so you can't build and you can't buy because there's nothing for sale, so the prices so must be so The prices price. are phenomenally expensive. If, if something came on the market, well, how expensive? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a well, two, two bedroom, bedroom would, would be in the, you know, uh, well, well over $10 million. Is it really? Yeah. Oh. It used to be associated with very old people who were walking around and, yeah. and you know, with their big, thick wallets. Now you see a lot of young families walking their children, uh, and, and there's a vitality there that to me, it seems fresh and new. But we're talking like young, rich, and famous? Is that that type of people? Not always like famous. Sometimes they are, you know, sort of under the, under the radar, under the radar uh, you know, just quietly amassing doing their wealth. thing, amassing wealth, and uh, yeah, yeah. I was reading about the Burning Man. Yeah. Apparently Burning Man is no longer Burning Man. It's become like the, the hub for the super wealthy startup billionaires like Zuckerberg and uh, there's an airstrip at Bur you, you've been, Man, you've been to Burning Man I have not been to Burning Man I think you could be a good candidate to investigate there no if you parachute in it's free okay you're um, thinking about doing that that would be one way to yeah to to get in there because it's pretty well, like other big tickets yeah you have this there's a, it's a hard get right now but isn't it amazing how the wealthy sort of co-op co-op all these things yeah. for themselves exactly. when 
in fact, in many cases, the, the Bohemians were there, the, the uh, people who are poor and creative got there first, and yeah. now the rich come in and say, no, I want a piece of that. Yeah. Yeah. And the Bohemians today are like trust baby who can afford not to work and do a painting and writing poetry all day right? It's so true. There's, there's that. There's also, of course, there are people like a good example, say Lady Gaga. She espouses Bohemian values, but of course, you know, she's at this point. I'm sure she's very separate from that. She probably travels by jet everywhere. But there, there will always be bohe there will always be people who are literally, you know, sort of out there on the on the margins. Right? I, I went to an event uh, a couple of years ago, and I was sitting next to this really suburban couple, just as nice as can be. And the person on my right said, "These are Lady Gaga's parents." What were what were her parents like? Did you get a feel for them? Incredibly normal. Yeah. Very yeah. simple people, uh, no uh, pretense at all. So you're Bohemian. I was struck by uh, how short their lives were. Yeah, I, th I think being a sensitive artist who insisted on creating art, who didn't go find a straight job, it was, I'd say, hell on their nerves. A lot of them found their way to substances. Others of them um, you know, were susceptible to disease and so forth. And, and um, they, like the first French model, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't last long. <laughs> Would Alan Poe fit into the, the Bohemian uh, category? Edgar Allan Poe? It's so interesting. Edgar Allan Poe, he died in 1849, 10 years before the FAF before, set. Yeah, okay. yeah. and his, one of his first biographers said, if only Poe had lived in America more um, like the France that had welcomed Baudelaire, um, mm -hmm. he would have, um, you know, would have had, a, had an easier time of it. It's, it's, um, it's funny because I think Poe obviously benefited from his madness and his substance abuse and everything else, but he was, you could call him a, he was never called a bohemian in his life um, as mm -hmm. an American who, who came of age earlier, but, but he was certainly a, a bohemian indeed, if not in name, so, yeah. There's, uh, people are enamored with that style of life. They, it's not like they like the story of it and the show they want to live it, but I feel like over the time it's, they've been mimicked a lot. Uh, it, it has been. No, I, it's, I always think about how romantic the notion. You had a whole period of jazz music and rock music oh, in which yeah. it was romantic. It was romanticized for others to see all these people who died young of drug overdoses yeah. and, and the people like Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix yeah. and so forth. Yeah. David, if you go back to your book and the big data, you think it's a good thing to lick information to the public? Right now, the, the risks are are very present and the benefits are maybe not yet, um, we're not yet enjoying them. Do you think we're going to in Europe with the type of war, it's no longer physical on the battlefield, but uh, I see like, like J.P. Morgan this morning in the newspaper is being attacked. Yeah. Like we don't know if the Chinese or Russians are like, do you think there's a lot of a war, commercial, corporate war going on? Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine, or, or state actors, you know, a, an electromagnetic pulse or something would would shut us down, and uh, if there's no internet, I can't do a lot, you know? Yeah. It began as an affectation, but I do do a, it's real now, I do um, a certain amount of composition, you know, on a typewriter and, and by hand, it's in case the NSA wants to steal yeah, my next no, that's novel. that's a good I idea. Would, you know, I wouldn't, well, and also if, there, if there's a power yeah. outage. Yeah, yeah. How many of you are on Facebook? Well, I would have to for the show. I'm on Facebook. You have to. I, I stomped away from Facebook a couple of years ago. You probably noticed the tremor in the yes. <laughs> internet Voice world. Big, yeah. um, but I, I, I came crawling back for the book, you know. Um, yeah, you have and to. You have to. Yeah. Your publisher yeah. forces you. I'm, I'm a Do newcomer to, okay. to Facebook. My sister put me on the other day. Uh, and out of nowhere, people that I hadn't heard from in years were being in touch with me, people that I didn't yeah. really want to hear from. Uh, and then I started looking at some of the comments, and honestly, some of them are simply inane, silly, self-absorbed. Uh, I mean, you, you, pe people are you know sort of pounding their chests in public, and I think that's that's um, pathetic. Justin, let's talk about uh, Walt Whitman now. Um, his masterpiece, uh, *Leaves of Grass*. I was mm -hmm. actually surprised. I, I was not aware that uh, there's been. Uh, six, seven editions, you kept revising it over the time. I like to think of it almost like um, the Constitution. It was sort of this living document that he just kept tinkering with, and he'd, he'd uh, rearrange the poems, he would add new poems, he would change his syntax over time, he'd change titles, and, um, and so there are 
Different scholars um, number there anywhere from six to 12 editions of Leaves of Grass. It depends on whether you consider certain. Did, did you read the first one and the last one, see how much uh, discrepancy there was? I, I, well, I did. I looked at some of the very first one, came out in 1855. Then what I call the FAFS edition came out in 1860. That was really the third edition. And then what's often called the Deathbed edition came out in 1892. And you can follow certain poems, like the famous poem Song of Myself. Mm -hmm. It starts in the 1855 edition and it gets tweaked and altered all the way through. I mean, some, some poems are introduced over time, but there are a handful of poems that go all the way from the first edition all the way through the last edition, and you can see changes to them all along the way, which is kind of, it's kind of both heartening to see that he had this kind of organic work and also a little unsettling to think, well, he never thought this book was done, so how, how can anybody finish anything? But you talk about changes, are they like more mature, more reflective, more introspective? A lot of the changes are actually kind of superficial. They are things like, at a certain point, he fell in love with the apostrophe for a word like blushed, B-L-U-S-H, apostrophe D. So something, so it was a quirk. Uh, m many more of the changes really had to do with him actually removing poems or adding new ones. That was much more of what it was. So removing a poem, adding a new one, and changing the order. That was, that was his main, um, as opposed to any kind of whole scale revision. And when, when did the book itself become a, uh, an institution in itself? By the, by the end of his life, he was a, a, a sort of a known or notable figure, and this book had been sort of given a, it had been given a good send-off into, into immortality, basically. And he definitely has his detractors. I mean, there are people who don't believe he is the great poet, the great American poet. A part of the tension that I, that, that I, I think actually has created his enduring fame is, is from the very beginning, there were, you know, he, he always had detractors, always people were horrified in the early days by free verse, horrified by his subject matter, romantic love between men and other subjects. Taboo. That, yeah, that, that helped. That, that always, that's, that's always a good formula for art is, is to have, you know, kind of the creative divide where half of people think you're wonderful and half. And yet it's one of the great beloved pieces of poetry in high schools. Th yeah, no, it was um, well characterized that way in that um, Robin Williams film, right? Yeah, yes, I mean, that, yeah. And, yes, uh, exactly. Dead Poets Society. Dead, Dead Poets Society. Society. And it, it uh, maybe it was, the, it was taught, but it was some of the first poetry um, that uh, that let me think that way, you know. Yeah. And a lot of reciting of it. I remember it being in high school, and we did Leaves of Grass, and I had one little line from it, uh, this whole great sort of chorus of, of people. And you survived. Well, yes. more than that, so yes. Uh, when you do a book like yours, I mean, uh, how does that start? You, you get the pictures, you, you write around the, the text, or you go for the history and you have a, a sort of an outline? Well, uh, this actually uh, came about because I had been thinking about the next book, and I went to see a documentary about Monte Carlo, and that's when I realized that Monte Carlo and Monaco had had this very poor beginning. Years ago, when I first went to uh, Monaco, my tour guide was a young woman who is now the ambassador in Washington. She we became friends. She was a young girl. And um, I knew that if I were going to embark on a book, that I would be able to have contacts there who would really help me. And I only spent a week there, because I'd been there enough times, you know, on the ground, meeting with people, going into the archives of various places. So. Uh, and then the photographs come after. Then I, you know, it gets plotted out, and Asseline does a great job of, 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 books, of yeah. uh, researching. It's also a beautiful publisher. And a beautiful publisher, yes, they are. How traumatic was uh, writing your book? How many drafts? Are you sweating up all night, so there was just like one bang draft and oh, gone? God, no, no. It was, <laughs> no, it was seven years. So it was Seven years, so you were really uh, thinking ahead of time when you started, yeah? And the first three chapters came quickly, and then it was a terrible slog. And the book that my editor bought was pretty different from the one I have now, and I'm very, very glad. Uh, but there were there were many, many, many drafts. I, it seems I don't know which when they began and stopped, so I couldn't put a number on it. But do you find the process working with the editors in publishing houses, especially bigger houses, to be uh, uh, frustrating, or because no. it's, a, it's a laborious process? Um, is it? it is, and maybe when I when I first began with my editor, I was afraid they were, you know tearing the art out of the story or something, but that's not what happened at all. They made it better, made it much better. That's great. So David, I'm curious, you, you described earlier that you've been doing some typing. Are you able to, compo are you able to write on the typewriter? Only, like only uh, uh, very early drafts. Mm -hmm. I have my grandma's IBM Selectric, 
which was you know state of the art yeah, until like, the yeah, early 80s. Yeah. There was no correction tape, but if you want to go X out three lines, you know, it's how long you want to press the X button. <laughs> I'm going way back. A couple of weeks ago, I bought a bottle of ink. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> found some pens. Pens. I did. Pens. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, uh, something you say, uh, sorry, you say you put uh, blue tape on your camera, on your yeah. computer. What was that about? I've never heard that. Uh, I said I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I'm not. However, it seems silly to assume that that camera only records when a little green light is on. Ah. So whether it's the NSA or the Chinese or some hacker in wherever, it just seems uh, silly not to put a piece of tape over the camera. Interesting. Uh. On that note, I wanted to thank you all for coming for the first episode of season two of Books du Jour. We have Pamela Fiore in the spirit of Monte Carlo which is all about Monaco. We never talk about Grace Kelly and uh, no. the Formula One and this uh, big key. icon. Yep. David Schaefer, Whiskey, Tango, Foxtrot, WTF, <laughs> for people who want to decode, right? <laughs> and Rebel Souls, Walt Whitman's and uh, the American's first Bohemians, but Justin Martin. Thank you very much for being on Books du Jour and uh, all the best with your book. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks, that was fun.